a lot of it flows from the top uh, because unless uh, the topmost right from the board the top management and then people down below have and demonstrate a very strong commitment to ethics and ethical play there is very little any governance framework will be able to achieve now we may be able to implement or design policies and you know processes but then if commitment to ethics doesn't exist then it is a problem so uh, it is a difficult subject because uh, and it's a very subjective topic um, but i guess we all understand what ethics stands for and what ethics means especially in the context of how a business enterprise needs to define its own personality in the eyes of internal and external stakeholders so that's the first point that i thought uh, was relevant on my mind top of my mind the second one is to do with the personal integrity connected on a linked point uh, now personal integrity again of the the board as well as the leadership team to begin with um and this is again you know uh, demonstrated by actions uh, and more by actions and less by uh, written and spoken words uh, because the you know the, the the leadership may just say a lot about uh, uh integrity but then unless it is backed up by actions and uh, is demonstrated on the ground it means very little so uh, and it's the reason i use the word personal integrity it's it, it goes beyond the professional realm it goes beyond what your or anyone's uh, role requires them to deliver so as a person as a professional as an individual what is the commitment to integrity so as very important uh aspect again is connected with the ethical state of mind but goes jointly goes together so uh, so so unless the leader or leaders are also demonstrating the levels of integrity uh it's very difficult for governance to really get driven the third point uh, is uh, the organization's commitment to fairness you know how fair uh, is an organization in terms of dealing with all its stakeholders not just some of them but the entire gamut of the entire uh, stakeholder so fairness uh, it becomes a very important uh, uh, aspect because uh, different situations fairness will have different meaning so unless in all situations with all stakeholders the organization demonstrates so uh, just as an example you know the 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 business uh, you know every business ends up into uh, some transactions where you may incur a profit you may incur a loss or you may generate profit but then how would you behave how would you how transparently would you deal with your customers in case you are uh, you are incurring a loss and uh, would you still be transparent with them in terms of okay fine this is uh, how i will go about it and this is what i will deliver to you uh, it becomes a very important point similarly being fair with uh, the suppliers being fair with the employees being fair with the entire ecosystem uh is a very important determinant of the quality of governance and a linked factor is transparency levels and fairness and transparency in a manner of speaking go together because uh, uh, again transparency unless uh, there is a willingness to stand up and be uh, open to be scrutinized and uh, be willing to be accountable uh, or, you know for the actions or sometimes mistakes sometimes failures a lot of that so how how transparent uh, again it's it relates to the leadership team and uh, uh, all of this really culminates into walking the talk uh, relating to uh, what kind of code of conduct uh, the organization and the leaders and the entire organization stand for uh, again code of conduct is a written piece of document everyone has it that really doesn't influence governance having saying that okay we have a code of conduct in our company uh, doesn't really make too much of an impact but walking the code of conduct with all the ingredients that uh, i have tried to cover becomes very important because this walking the talk on the code of conduct and how it is being disseminated how it is being percolated how it is being um, you know uh, understood by the entire organization and how the organization demonstrate that it stands behind the code and stands for the code it has set for itself it could be whatever there's no specific template but then whatever is the code uh, of conduct uh, that becomes very very important for an organization to really walk the talk so just to close and summarize the five points that i talked about the first one is 
the role of ethics and how it influences, determines, and drives uh, the quality and the extent of uh, governance. The second one being personal integrity of the leaders. The third one is fairness of uh, the actions. The fourth one was around transparency levels. And the fifth one is walking the talk on the code of conduct. Uh, this, is a, this is a long subject. It's a very detailed subject. So I thought I'll just vary at a very, very high level, summarize some four or five uh, aspects. And of course, uh, and then we can talk more during the Q&A session. But I thought these are the key aspects which people might find relevant and useful. Thanks, Peter. I think this bucketize the entire aspect of corporate governance. Obviously, if we drill down, it can go uh, an endless discussion. So thanks for putting these five bullet points. Those are very, very critical. Uh, Smear, uh, in you can say, if we talk about, say, Lens Start, uh, the organization started in 2010, and within 10 years, uh, this uh, our organization get, got valued at $1.5 billion with a, you can say, a significant amount of uh, uh, investment by the external investors. Now, in that context, obviously, uh, the startup, uh, you can say, starting from zero and bringing at that level uh, is a big task. It's not easy to convert a smallest organization um, within a less than a decade time from zero to, say, 500 outlets and, uh, uh, you can say, valuing uh, around $1.5 billion. Uh, in that context, uh, Smir would like to hear from you about your experience of startup uh, governance. How a journey of corporate governance goes in a startup? Uh, sure, Chandan. Uh, so I think uh, Neeraj has already well summarized uh, uh, quite a fair amount of you know uh, the the core crux of corporate governance in a very beautiful and a very simple manner. So I'll I'll, I'll kind of leave that aside. But I think, uh, see, uh, if I specifically talk about, uh, you know, the startup. So I think, uh, see, what is, from a startup perspective, what is the purpose of, a, you know, a corporate governance? It's basically just to balance the interest between multiple stakeholders, whether it's investors or whether it's management or the employees or the, you know, multiple stakeholders so that, you know, uh, it's an objective in a very objective and transparent manner. Everybody is kind of aligned to the same uh, journey and the thought process in a very cohesive manner. Now, when I talk about, um, so I'll not take a specific example of Lenscard uh, because Lenscard is also one of the representatives of, uh, you know, very many startups uh, which which are functioning in India. So I think in a startup, in a typical startup where the focus is primarily on, you know, driving the uh, innovations and, and also, you know, driving a stupendous growth, which most of our startups are kind of known for. See, governance style will evolve depending on the size of the organization, the ownership structure of the company, and also most importantly, the stage of evolution of the business. Because see, different rules and practices will apply at different point in time. So, you know, one size fit all kind of an approach to governance generally won't, you know, work. And that's been my experience also. And I, I strongly believe that, you know, uh, uh, you know, that every startup should actually uh, deploy a more, uh, you know, evolutionary approach to corporate governance, especially, you know, because at every stage of evolution of the company, the, com the startup will have to deal with different kind of, uh, you know, business requirements. It'll have to deal with different set of stakeholders. It'll have to deal with different set of investor expectations also as the business grows. And also last but not the least, you know, that the whole legal and the regulatory framework and the requirement will also grow as the business grows. So having an evolutionary approach to corporate governance is always better. You can't do everything on day one, but when you are at a mature stage, you can't be, you know, just thinking of starting something. So it has to be a, a evolutionary approach. So if I, uh, Chandan, if I categorize all the startups, uh, the life cycle of a startup, I would categorize into four parts. One is the inception stage, wherein the idea is born, founder has picked up, you know, two, three people who think who he or she feels that he's comfortable with. They are starting to run the company and you know, in limited cash. So at this point in time, the corporate governance would be more around just check in the box approach wherein you are meeting just the basic mandatory legal and, you know, tax compliances, 
you know making ensuring that your books uh, and accounting is happening on time cash flows are being monitored you know and in the early phase it's always the founders who kind of you know are more uh, driven you know they are the ones who are taking the most of the shots then comes a stage 2 of a company wherein you know you get the first check of eli which is a, any vc funding happens on you know this is a stage wherein the corporate governance has to go uh beyond managing just day to day compliances and this is the you know time also when a formal board also gets activated so you know the board starts reviewing the progress of the business seeing the performance of uh, you know all the actions that are committed and also you know uh, starts approving all the long term capital investment decisions and all that and this is the time you know when actually the basics starts coming into picture like having a, a very robust chart of authority matrix defining a very structured policies whether it is finance legal hr all the functions the the structured way of doing things ethics policy for that matter neeraj has that picked up you know uh, beautifully and then you know also bringing in the good statutory auditors depending on the size of the business of course who can actually really vouch for the integrity and uh, accuracy and consistency of the financial data being presented because that's that will start becoming very very important and then comes the stage 3 now you are a grown up boy and you know you're being known in the industry people are willing to put money and you start getting a you know a bigger check so once you get a bigger check the life life changes you know especially from a corporate governance standpoint because you know it's not only the money which is coming in there's a lot of responsibility which also comes along with that money because now you you have some you are dealing with somebody else's money and they have put in the money for a certain reason so you know corporate governance at this stage assumes the utmost significance you know given the stakeholders which are involved so you know this is the time when actually startups and depending on what stage they get the pe investors and all that so this is the stage when startups also bring in the professionals to manage the business help founders you know run the business in a more uh, you know governed manner in a more objective manner uh, and this is a time you know uh, also the whole uh, formalized structure of having a internal audit uh, you know process uh, gets kicked in all the relevant governance committees uh, you know like audit committee investment committee compensation committee whistle blower for that matter or or you know ethics committee posh these are the kind of frameworks which starts kicking in and they have to because now the structure and stature of the organization is pretty wider and, and in fact this is a time when lot of significant matters are also kind of you know delegated by the board to these expert committees and last but not the least at this stage the board also then starts you know feeling the need of getting a, a expert on on you know specific committees like audit committee and even the having the need of an independent uh, you know director on the board and the last but not the least the stage of a life cycle of a company is the when you get into the road to the ipo because this is a stage when you know any kind of a, a, you know allegation with regard to misappropriation mismanagement or any loophole in the overall governance of the company can be really fatal to the overall ipo prospect so you know has to be so this is a time when the companies evolve further and they put in uh, you know specific team of experts who can formulate and implement you know governance principles the whole uh, you know uh, ethics policies and the risk framework you know steering that piece so i think these are multiple stages of a startup now depends on the size of the organization depends on the maturity of the organization this will always evolve and this will evolve with time but having said that you know to uh, neeraj's point actually uh, whatever stage you are the focus of the governance has to be that you know there are strong uh, checks in place to curb any kind of misappropriation mismanagement avoid any situation of conflict of interest ensure you know absolutely there is no misuse of company resources and i think last but not the least most importantly what neeraj picked up on is this walking the talk i think that's the most important so it's not a, just a book on corporate governance lying in the company but actually the entire management and the leadership is walking the talk so that's in my view chandan is the is the journey of a corporate governance in a startup yeah. 
Thanks, Meer. I think uh, this was quite uh, uh, interesting to hear the entire corporate governing journey, linking with the business uh, growth journey, from how the business starts and how it overall evolves. I think this was really, really great uh, and insightful. Uh, Meer, one question has come. I am not sure uh, if this has been covered. If you'd like to add something more into this, uh, some Mr. Vivek Jain has mentioned that how a startup organization can integrate. governance from top level to bottom level to of the organization <clears throat> see i think neeraj uh, already picked it up very beautifully it's not about uh, you know this is not a book which you can write and circulate to the to the entire company that this has to be followed from tomorrow it's all about you know walking the talk so i think the whole concept you know of uh, you know uh, how you how you kind of uh, you know reflect the ethics in your behavior how you you know your commitment so organizations commitment to integrity organization commitment to fairness in dealing with multiple stakeholders and the transparency more important is your openness to this and it has to flow in from the top right from the founders since we talking about startups so right from the founders to the to the the cxos and 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 their drs i think everybody has to talk the same language and there has to be consistent you can't say because i am doing it because somebody told me at the top to do this it has to be part of the culture it's like values your values of any organization are not only the piece of paper written on the wall you have to really walk the talk and i think there has to be constant i think intervention from uh, multiple stakeholders to ensure that there you know thermometer is keeping a check on that <laughs> i would i would say that you know very good that's my view thanks thanks lot smeer uh, i think there are a lot of questions which are which have already started coming in we'll take it uh, you can say over the time maybe at the yeah uh, never we talk about a startup we, uh, the funding becomes most important part in terms of uh, the uh, getting the p fund and different uh, sort of uh, investors to come into the business and uh, one of the drivers for the funding is obviously the right rating right uh, uh, you can say the uh, overall perception of the company in the market and obviously rating becomes one of the critical factor and as goro is uh, driving the uh, entire corporate governance practice of crisil now uh, from the uh, you can say use, user perspective from the corporate perspective who gets the rating from crisil or maybe any other uh, rating agency uh, we would like to hear goro what are the whether the corporate governance piece becomes a part of the rating of any organization by the rating agency and if yes uh, uh, would you like to hear what could be the key component of that uh thank you chandan uh, it's a it's a very pertinent one and i think the length and breadth with which uh, neeraj and smeer have already covered i would not want to talk about corporate governance per se uh, it the interesting thing is uh, my my 10 year old daughter was asking me that what is this session on and i answered that it is on corporate governance and she asked me what is what do you what do you mean by that and i was just telling that if i have to just say it in few phrases or one line to a 10 year old i say it's about doing the right thing and nothing else <laughs> and you know as neeraj talked about you know the ethics part the culture part the walking the talk i mean i have to just really sum up for for anyone who is whenever we are able to do the right thing it will somewhere uh, form part of that governance and so uh, let me let me answer your question in um, in an analogy and i think no no conversation and no discussion will be complete uh, if we will ignore the elephant inside and outside our rooms of covid so i'll probably use that as an example to kind of explain and i think one thing which we have heard uh, most uh, these days in last 3 months uh, in covid is is about immunity yeah. so here is what i would explain you know rating agencies when they are evaluating organizations when they are evaluating um, uh, any particular debt instrument or any organizational structure all the uh obvious factors that go into that conversation will include you know adequacy of capital what is the earning potential what is you know asset liability management process 
these are all i would call the hardcore quantitative factors which will go into in evaluating and arriving at the rating and this is something which we keep on measuring uh, in our body if you take our body as an example you know what is my uh, blood sugar level what is my uh, hemoglobin what is my blood pressure and all the other investigations that that we do and those are actually indicators of what is going what is your health what is the health of your organization what is the health of your body at the same time what is the inconspicuous part of this entire thing which is not visible that is what is the thinking of management one key aspect which gets considered uh, you know in evaluating the rating includes goals and strategies what is the vision of the management what are the systems and monitoring uh, processes in place for the management what is management's risk appetite what is the history what is the competency what is the integrity is management credible all of these questions you know when they when you when, when an analyst asks and tries to assess and weaves into this entire methodology of arriving into a rating all this intangible and inconspicuous and if i relate back to the example i would call this this is what will judge the behavior of the organization should there be a stress test and that is where immunity really comes in so i will equate you know corporate governance in some shape and form uh, the the immunity uh, of a organization how will an organization react despite um, all the pressures that it, you know it it will so yes the it is considered but it is weaved as part of the management analysis part of how do we evaluate it i i hope that answers it thanks gorav uh, just one thing uh, further into this the components which you said that like management thinking uh, management analysis how does uh, I, i'm sure uh, you you will not be able to share the methodology or calculation behind that but how does these computed it in the in terms of a number because these are all conceptual things yeah how does so which is yeah which is where i would i would call that there is the uh, art part of art and science balance which will come uh, in the in the rating piece uh, if it was actually just science actually a, a model or a bot will be able to give us that rating isn't it <laughs> so maybe we will get there maybe that's a topic for uh, that's a discussion and the way platforms are coming up and we are able to analyze lot of behaviors as well maybe we will get there one day but okay. that is that is still there so there is a Uh, intangible and inconspicuous part which is not which is not certain so for example you have multiple plans so when we are um, for future projections which go into the future earning potential if you are getting the future projection then you are doing rating year on year how are they actually holding up whether you are able to hold uh, management's word what is the history uh, on those aspects all of these factors helps analysts determine um, you know how to what extent that reliance can be placed and then uh, a weightage goes into as an important factor but definitely it's a definitely a very important part of the evaluation great no great uh, gorav thanks a lot uh, i think this covers uh, the very critical piece of uh, uh, the most important question uh, answer of the question is whether these becomes a critical part while deciding the rating and i think uh, we all were able to get answer that yes these are important these are important factors uh, being considered by the rating agency and uh, obviously uh, these need to be maintained apart from the business culture from the rating perspective also thank you gaurav uh, now i'll come back to neeraj uh, neeraj in current situation of covid 19 all the organizations uh, and obviously most of the organization are facing challenges in terms of managing their cash flow and in this uh, condition obviously uh, all the organizations are identifying or find trying to find different ways to raise capital raise uh, funds and uh, as i was going through with your social media updates i got to know that in this difficult time you are able to raise a uh, significant amount of ncds within a very short uh, time period after the covid 19 started and that in itself uh, reflect that uh, how you are managing the entire capital management piece as well as uh, the governance uh, environment in the business 
in this context we would like to understand your uh, perspective and would like to understand from you the role of corporate governance in the capital raising process of any organization how critical corporate governance is to raise capital absolutely no thanks thanks uh, tanan in fact you gave the example uh, which uh, i would have otherwise shared um and just to add to that uh, you know this uh, money and this is this one part of uh, you know we raised uh, debt to tied over the liquidity uh, issue which uh, hit everyone at the same time uh, the point that i want to emphasize that this money was uh, this these debentures are unsecured so um it was uh, why we were successful in raising unsecured capital uh, on the debt side is uh, also linked with the perception or experience or i would say the overall uh, uh image that uh, the company uh, you know enjoys in the minds of investors so someone asked a question that you know in this uh, does the board need to change their approach towards governance in this current environment and uh, whether uh, it uh, you know it it makes an impact the, the point that i would make is the uh, you know when let's say you are uh, in a in a flight okay and there is serious turbulence what happens the captain immediately asks you to fasten your seat belt now you are able to fasten your seat belts because the seat belts are there in the aircraft when there is turbulence you can't uh, have a situation where uh, the crew searches for seat belts to give to you now governance is like your seat belt and that's exactly what uh, you know if you just uh, build that out um you can't build governance and your image and your credibility when the going gets tough you you've got to build your governance principles and your practices and your uh, entire track record when uh, the the flight is in the cruise mode and that's where it should or god forbid if there is some serious turbulence you can simply tighten the seat belts and then you will uh, you will be fine so coming to the point that you know how you know while this may appear to be a very subjective topic and something nice to hear nice to talk nice to uh, you know listen but how does it translate into reality in terms of you know the the business impact in, uh, when it comes to raising money raising capital now capital i am using generically it could be equity it could be debt um See, look at any investor's uh, viewpoint. Uh, investors want to optimize their risk-reward ratio or the risk-reward equation. They want the uh, you know best of return at the least possible risk. Uh, any good governed company which has demonstrated its track record uh, in terms of uh, following some of these practices is highly, highly likely to have uh, you know a business risk profile which will be moderate to low for an investor. so that's that's one immediately any like gorov also talked about you know credit rating so you know credit rate credit rating agencies help the investors take a decision so that, so so their their assessment of you know whether it's a double a or a triple a or a a minus or whatever it is is a reflection on the credit worthiness of any business of course these are there are the business quantity quantitative aspects of it this is the qualitative aspect and it does contribute for an investor so the risk profile and the risk um investment risk um, uh, you know uh, implication for an investor for a good governed company or a well governed company is definitely lower uh, the other important uh, you know comfort which an investor gets is uh, a view on the sustainability of the business uh, initiatives or the business itself chances are a, a well governed company a better managed company from a governance point of view will be able to sustain and uh, uh, again a case in point is companies who, are, who have been able to raise so much capital in this phase reliance comes to my mind now we may have different views and perspectives but the fact is there is a sustainability angle attached to it so investors prefer companies which are sustainable and uh, which have a risk reward profile which uh, balances in their mind and they are very happy to lend they are very happy to invest uh in a more evolved investor world uh, especially the west it's now catching up in india as well there is this uh, concept called esg which stands for the environmental focus of 
a business, the societal responsibility that a business demonstrates, and G stands for governance. So, so there are certain investors whose criteria is to assess the ESG score of an investee company before they take an investment decision. And uh, G as in governance of that ESG model is a very, very critical element uh, as well. And there are a lot of uh, you know, evolved investors, mature investors like pension funds in the US and uh, um, some uh, you know, funds owned by you know, large government bodies, they, 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 they are making it a requirement as well. So it is a matter of time. This is not going to be an optional uh, subject for the Indian corporate, Indian, Indian business entities to um, consider. This is going to become, is already becoming uh, a must have focus area. And last but not the least, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it starts to uh, impact, you know, how an entity is able to um, manage the rewards for the investors. So for a bank, it will be simply an interest that they will be happy to get and the principal amount, whatever they have to get back at the maturity. But for an equity investor, it is the the overall uh, you know uh, PE multiple which the investment is able to generate, and uh, this does matter. So uh, you if you just do a research around companies which enjoy a better PE uh, you know uh, equation, you will generally find that the governance score of those companies is is uh, on the higher side. So that's what I think uh, when it comes to attracting the right quality of capital and the right quantity of capital at the right time. Uh, how governance influences all of these. Thanks a lot, Neeraj, for this really insight, <laughs> detailed insight. And uh, uh, I really like this ESG model. And obviously, this gives the importance of the governance in the entire piece of investor mindset and the fundraising. And uh, I loved your example of the seed belt. Uh, obviously, without having a seed belt, we can't expect to use it in the pandemic situation like COVID. So that's really a uh, great, great uh, insight. Smeer, uh, till now we were talking about different questions and uh, obviously in Bates on Peace, uh, COVID-19 was coming into that directly or indirectly. Obviously that is, that is impacting all the business that is uh, also going to impact for the recent future in the certain time period. And in that environment, so far we were talking indirectly about COVID-19. Now I would like to put a direct question to you. In terms of go corporate governance, what are the required changes or maybe uh, you can say uh, substantial modification in the existing governance framework to help to uh, manage the current pandemic by uh, you can say any organization that could be at any category of organization you may take example and uh, would like to hear from you. Yeah, Chandan, I think it's a very good question and uh, I think more than the more than the changes, I would call it a modification actually. See, because see, we all know that uh, this COVID-19 crisis has been really disruptive for a lot of businesses and actually it has not only caused a financial drain, but a lot of mental drain uh, to most of the organizations. And these are unprecedented times and, you know, and, uh, and, and actually speaking, you know, in the middle of these crises, I think survival uh, always takes an edge and, you know, you are more driven by short term firefighting and, and you know, all that. So I think uh, though the, from any uh, good corporate governance standpoint, I think the expectations don't mellow down. So your investors will still have the similar expectation what they will have from you in a normal course of event. But I think rather uh, some bit of a modifications which are definitely required to be done at this stage during these kind of crises, I mean, uh, COVID is uh, one that we've seen in our life cycle. There can be many more, but I think what it has taught us that, you know, uh, during these times, couple of modifications and serious modifications, which I think every uh, company needs to bring in are, you know, uh, one is that, you know, I think assessing the overall uh, business continuity and the going concern mm -hmm. of the business. See, because uh, current circumstances has definitely put a, you know, cast a doubt on going concern of many organizations. So I think the first priority should be to assess the going concern assumption, even while preparing the financials. And uh, it's, it's a duty of the management to provide the most realistic uh, business projection and the expected cash flow projections on a real time basis. 
uh, to ensure that if there are any early warning signals uh, that is you know informed to the board well in advance i mean giving a bad news at the end is it's not something which is which is uh, desirable and uh, you know organizations ability to keep all the critical functions on and ability to still you know uh, kind of meet all the statutory obligations on time so one is this uh, you know uh, assessing the overall business continuity and the and the going concern piece second most important modification which needs to be done is you know uh, keeping the board fully engaged and informed hmm. in the normal course of the event you may have board meetings and you know you uh, present the performance to the board and you know you keep the board fully engaged but 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 these are the times actually when the requirement goes far higher so you need to keep uh, you know board fully informed of the emerging risk of pandemic on the on your business and seek constant guidance from the board uh, you know to be able to fight this battle actually so any effect on board needs to be informed on any effect on uh, your supply chain your manufacturing uh, ability your uh, ability to not to serve customers any implication on changing government guidelines forex fluctuations your ability to not honor certain contracts you know this receivable risk or especially the inventory risk because a lot of businesses are actually uh, you know they are driven by perishables or, or they are driven by products having a expiry date so i think it's very very important that you know board needs to be constantly engaged and informed communicate communicate i think that's that's the key third aspect is i think uh, which uh, you know is also touched upon uh, you know uh, briefly by neeraj is that you know managing and uh, conservation of uh, capital i think so i think again as a good corporate governance during these times uh, board must get frequent uh, briefing on the liquidity situation of the company so you know what is the if there is any short term liquidity crunch or a risk that the company is sitting on and similarly you know uh, during these times i think your overall approval mechanism of approving any new uh, capex or opex commitments has to strengthen because again at the end of the day survival is the core during these times and last but not the least you know because this is the first time i think everybody is kind of working from home and and we are and distant uh, you know working has become a norm i think a very strong focus uh, you know on the uh, cyber risk and data privacy has become far far more important than anything else so, you know updating your it systems uh, ensuring your it controls are in place ensure that you define the protocols of sharing the data amongst different stakeholders doing the vulnerability assessment testing also of your systems uh, so that there's no you know kind of a possible uh, you know hacking which you are prone to so i think these are the four uh, key things that you need to really further modify and add to your normal day to day you know conduct and 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 the behavior and, and board i think every matured board would expect the management to do this great uh, sweet i think it was quite uh, insightful and uh, need of the hour primarily if i say and i uh, if the if i talk about the key points which i taken is one is the most important keeping board engaged absolutely updated that's the most important apart from that uh, if we don't do that obviously that will create more distrust and uh, can create uh, additional pandemic for the company so thanks for giving the entire insights uh, moving on the um, next question to gorov and uh, gorov you have been managing and heading the risk management function for the many companies in the past and currently as well mm, and when we talk about corporate governance risk management becomes a key component of that and uh, in that uh, context would like to hear the top down approach of uh, keeping yourself or keeping the management on top of the key risk of the company how uh, top management maybe a ceo or maybe chairman of the audit committee keep them, themselves uh, you can say aware about the top risk and how that can be controlled so uh, it is little paradoxical actually that you know in the times of you know again sorry going back to covid again but i think the way this scenario has played uh, sometimes i think that no amount of preparation no organization in this world was actually prepared to manage the risk 
uh, of this uh, statute and this order it's almost i mean i am i'm tempted to call this as a black swan event but i think by definition the way the number of events that have happened in last decade uh, that defeats the definition of black swan i mean if i talk about brexit if i talk about 2008 isis so in last 8 to 10 years there so many other incidents uh, have also happened that you know uh, the black swan is also becoming more and more uh, routine if i may call so i mean i'll i'll quickly just jump to you know what i would recommend uh, uh, the management the boards the actually the operating group of any organization uh, to be mindful of i don't think we can ever be prepared fully on all the risks having said that i think we will always need to make that endeavor make that extra effort to keep to, to be mindful of various aspects that can threaten the business existence of business impact on business and all of that so i recommend overall you know 3s uh, approach uh, on this and all these 3s and i would call them as stress testing i would call them sensitivity analysis and scenario modeling so i'm sorry for using these slightly jargonish sounding words but these the, the meaning of these words is very very simple if you follow this three s approach typically they they emanate from a, uh, a risk management learning from a financial model and largely financial risk but they are becoming really true for all the all categories of risk be it regulatory be it operational be it it all all uh, categories of risk are becoming relevant so the three s also is about stress testing which involves really identification of risk factors and then stressing those factors on your on your business identify those factors and test that how would our business hold up against uh, against that scenario for example best of the business continuity plans that were laid pre covid scenario would have never budgeted or planned for 100% or 90% staff working from home for more than one week it's unheard of i thought that in our organization the previous organization where we have set up a bcp we even test our technology and disaster recovery process on weekend we don't even do it on weekdays so the idea is that when the real when the real situation hits you whether you are prepared to deal with that risk or not so so stress testing which was a thing of a past and which was a thing largely for the financial models it's becoming more and more relevant for the current sensitivity analysis and scenario modeling sensitivity analysis is just looking at one factor how sensitive is my business to one particular factor and then then playing that all and scenario modeling whereas we we identify various factors collectively impacting or a particular scenario uh, stressing the business on a particular scenario and doing a modeling on how it will play out how are the various mitigation plans that business may have set up in place how would they play out so um, sorry for sounding little jargonous but i think these three are other terms which more and more organizations will have to embrace accept and i think that is what will further take the risk management to the next level great i think thanks a lot gorav and uh, obviously these three s are very very important and uh, obviously it's not easy to implement or uh, you can say do all sort of uh, stress testing as you mentioned and especially in the situation like uh, current pandemic all the expectations and testing will go uh, you can say yeah. uh, in toss but yes we need to have, be prepared to the maximum extent whatever we can manage and uh, thanks a lot for giving your thought around this how to inculcate ethical culture in the business and it is uh, the question which came uh, also linked it with the whistle blower mechanism how a whistle blower mechanism uh, can be defined or how it actually helps in terms of uh, getting the insights of the company hmm. so uh, an interesting uh, question uh, but it's uh, it's more to do with like, like i said you know the ethics is a state of mind i think is not something that you can say to find this is how we will uh, this is what i think and ethics could mean different for different people by the way there is no one un- uniform unique definition of ethics um we all understand it we all uh, when it comes to us being uh, a customer or 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 a recipient 
uh, we understand and we know what kind of ethic we are ex- we we expect the question we have to ask ourselves is do we translate the same when we become the service providers or when we become the um uh, you know deliverer of a particular ethical um, you know transaction or an experience that we are going to uh, render to someone so it is it is a bit subjective uh, but the the mood point is it can only be expressed by actions and not by intent uh so so simple things like uh, uh, you know when it comes to um dealing with a customer issue um you know whether you want to go strictly by the written contract or you want to have fairness and then demonstrate that okay you can go out of the way to solve a customer's problem and also uh, you know be fair in terms of how you close a particular uh, issue or or a but particular complaint um how ethically would you want to deal with your customers uh, a customer may not have a contractual or a legal recourse all the time that's where ethics comes into uh, into play uh, insurance companies classical example you know where uh, an insurance company can have can 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 hide behind uh, the complicated terms and conditions and jargon and uh, stuff like that and deny claim but if there is ethical play at the back of how a claim of an insurance company will be processed uh that's where some of these uh, you know concepts do get tested out um now the the the, the issues which um, uh, you know really start to impact on this doesn't change overnight you know this is a cultural aspect doesn't doesn't change overnight uh, one has to be conscious one has to be aware one has to be committed to playing ethically you know and just like in a cricket match uh, where does ball tampering ethics start and end you know you really have to decide you know what constitutes a tampering of a ball or what is a normal uh, whatever uh, actions that a bowler can take to be uh, you know uh, sharp in his deliveries uh, it's it's just like that uh, whistle blower yes it is a very integral element of uh, the overall governance structure um, and it's a game now uh, Uh, a lot to do with what kind of uh, uh, you know framework policy and practices any company follows uh, having just a whistle blow policy by itself is not good enough making sure that you talk about that whistle blow of policy you educate your people you encourage them to speak up and when they do speak up you have the courage to deal with that and when uh, they they really bring something to your notice not to feel offended not to become defensive not to start you know again so a lot of reactions can happen uh, so whistle blower is a lot to do with that a real test of a whistle blower framework is uh, you know when you really find people bringing uh, you know genuine complaints and uh, not so genuine complaints and so on and so forth uh, a very important element very integral element and uh, it is uh, uh, important for Uh, any company to make sure that uh, they are uh, following it in letter and spirit some of these elements thanks please as i think this was uh, quite comprehensive and in uh, very limited words you explained the entire whistle blower mechanism in detail i'll say that covers the end to end aspect of receiving the complaint managing it uh, closing it uh, and uh, educating people about the entire framework so that's quite uh, uh, useful and obviously ethics is something which uh, takes time and which need which is a uh, more of the softer aspect aspect which needs to be developed goro a question for you is uh, in internal audit at many times uh, mm, the auditors doesn't uh, you can say uh, primarily focus on completion of audit and uh, at many times it becomes a tick in the box process in a you can say how what could be your guidance to the audit com- community or internal audit community in order to give a true profit maximization value to the organization and uh, including this uh, one more part is primarily uh, the audit of corporate governance that is another question which is uh, which has came together that one is profit maximization based audit and second is that audit corporate governance uh, usually as an internal auditor no one audit that what would be your guidance into this so uh, i will just uh, spend a minute uh, on both the both the questions 
so the first one the profit maximization uh, so you know let let's go back to the basics of the objective of internal audit is to provide assurance on the internal controls built by uh, embedded in various processes uh, that is that should always remain the primary objective of uh, internal audit that's that's the assurance activity as part of that assurance activity because internal auditors are evaluating that process in such a level of detail there are possibilities and there are options where you should have an objective of identifying what are the value adding activities that can be introduced as part of process efficiency as part of controls optimization etc etc i would suggest that i would not recommend going into an internal audit uh, with the objective of profit maximization keep that as a by product and keep your minds open because management ex expects that kind of value but first and foremost there's no point of doing prof or giving suggestions which are on profit maximization compromising uh, and not doing justice to the core of uh, the internal issue so there has to be a very very right balance that has to be with respect to the second question on the corporate governance i think you know most of you may have definitely heard uh, about the concept of culture uh, audits and culture reviews actually that is uh, and whenever we are doing say sarbanes oxley compliance testing in addition to all the financial reporting controls all the operational controls one key element which gets evaluated are entity level controls which are nothing but the controls which have an overriding impact on the entire entity beyond the financial reporting and operational process those entity level controls are nothing but evaluation of corporate governance nature of activity so in the list of entity level controls when you evaluate you would see that what whether there is a code of conduct how often that is uh, revise how is there an adherence process is there a training uh, mechanism in place to adhere so what is management's oversight on that entire piece because if entity level controls are not working and extremely weak i e the corporate governance values are not there all the financial reporting or all the operation controls and no matter how good it may be override or other factors uh, will be at play and will always be a risk so there is no so called corporate governance audit but through entity level controls they do get covered and entity level controls evaluation should be a part of every internal audit plan at least once in two years if not every year and uh, you would have recently heard you know uh, richard chambers uh, who is actually the president of the iia who is he's a very experienced internal audit practitioner more than four decades of uh, experience and um, leading that entire profession and i think he's been written but many papers on uh, how mature organizations are adopting the actual audit of culture so there is an actual audit of a uh, culture within the audit plan that sits you know which evaluates the aspects of corporate governance again it is in the very nascent stage i don't think many organization have reached the level that they are they are doing but uh, if you would if you would recall this incident of wells fargo that happened uh, in us uh, where the practices on on the uh, sales professionals the, the way sales professionals were encouraged to do the uh, uh, bypass the process to meet their meet, meet their targets how that culture of um, following targets was so intensely followed it actually followed and when that incident happened the board first of all actually advised the management and the audit committee was to do a culture level change and culture audit uh, independent audit was conducted to evaluate that part so it is slowly and steadily coming into the fore and it will definitely be part of the audit plan as we go forward that's great so obviously that's great to hear and then only it can become a real value uh in the interest of time i'll just take one last question which has came to uh, as in advance and that i would like to uh, push it to uh, you can say would request smir to take that question uh, the question was smir in uh, linking with the previous question which gaurav was answering in terms of profit maximization 
one of the separate question came was uh, at times there is conflict between profit maximization and corporate governance uh, in that the the question was how to handle that situation and would like to hear your perspective around that <laughs> yeah it's an interesting one actually so i think uh, see first of all i think fundamentally all of us we should uh, align to one fact that every company you know the objective of every company is maximization of the you know value of the shareholders actually because that's that's the key and uh, and and you know uh, as uh, gorav already touched it upon that you know uh, that you know investors or, or you know anybody would like to optimize their you know risk reward ratio and especially in the companies which are highly governed and you know wherein you know they they can rely on and the practices of the company i think uh, they feel much secured and hence uh, they don't uh, mind uh, you know putting in their money and their investments i think i think gorav i think neeraj elaborated that very well mm -hmm. uh, but i think uh, see there'll always be shortcuts which people would want to take and and i am not saying every time the shortcuts will be non ethical uh, there will be sometimes you know you may want to jump certain policies to do something which is you know uh, very random and and knee jerk reactions and all that so i think there has to be a balance between uh, you know uh, what the time demands vis a vis what is the right thing to do for the business because at the end of the day eventually we should do what is right for the business but i think the need of the hour also uh, requires you to take an appropriate action or a decision within the appropriate time also so i think i think there'll always be a conflict but at the end of the day from a long term perspective every organization will gain if has good strong practices in place you know i think a, an organization with a good uh, governance principles you know will 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 eventually you know definitely improve its uh, competitiveness it also build more credibility with its uh, you know uh, investors it will build more credibility with its business partners with its uh, you know vendors with its customers and all that because people then feel that this is an organization which follows you know a certain standards of operations and i cannot bypass those so once you start i think uh, practicing and as neeraj already picked it up walk the talk i think that's the most important word so i think beyond the point if you don't walk the talk it doesn't make it sense but if you really walk the talk people will sooner or later realize that this is the way this organization operates and people will start building trust in you eventually which will impact your long term profitability of the company and hence the valuation of the shareholders and i think there is nothing more important to any founder any businessman and any company than the valuation of the shareholders actually if shareholder is not gaining at the end of the day then there's no point in doing that business actually that that's what my view is actually very good very very rightly uh, explained this smear uh, and at the end ultimately it needs to be balanced and it needs to be correct in the best interest of the company absolutely there are endless list of questions uh, there is you can say uh, each and every questions are very critical and uh, i would love to answer and get answer of uh, all three of you on each and every questions but uh, on the best interest of time as of now we'll have to uh, wind it up and uh, we will have to close it up asap and uh, maybe i'll try to consolidate these questions and will share over the email and if we if you get an opportunity and if you can answer a couple of those that would be really helpful uh, i'm just trying to summarize the entire discussion which is very very difficult it was an entire insightful uh, you can say conversation and lot of inputs came in uh, we heard about the five key components of the corporate governance from neeraj which was really uh, hitting the nail ethics integrity fairness code of conduct and transparency these five are the bible uh, uh, then we move to smear and uh, he very rightly and uh, very appropriately addressed the question of how a startup grows and how the corporate governance structure also also grows according to the growth of the organization then uh, we got a very good insight from gorav about the rating perspective which is very very important for all the organizations and uh, it uh, helped us to understand how to uh, 
manage or you can say how to how to improve how, try to improve our ratings uh, the corporate rating using the corporate governance framework uh, we understood uh, the egc model and uh, and uh, understood how needle help was able to get the fund in this difficult time and uh, i'm sure most of us would uh, you can say try to uh, apply those basic rules which you follow and uh, obviously smear has helped us to understand how to manage uh, the current situation of covid-19 in terms of cor corporate governance and push best part was keeping the board updated that's a key in line which i can take uh, and that is most important uh, goro helped us to understand the three s of the risk management and uh, that is stress testing sensitivity analysis and scenario modeling though as goro himself may say, said that these are quite complex terms but yes uh, we these are important the way of implementation could be different but yes these are very critical part of the risk management uh, i would like to thank all the participants and especially the panel over here neeraj basur gaurav auja and smir many many thanks for coming uh, uh, in this session and uh, you can say giving time which is very difficult i know based on the role based on the uh, the responsibility you are you all three are driving it is very difficult to extract time from that and thanks a lot for coming thank you thank you thanks thank you. Thank, thank you all, you all. all right take care bye. bye bye thank you everyone thanks